Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very pleased to be joined by Warren Kennard, the founder of ConnectEd, an educational venture that is uh, in process as we speak. Warren, welcome to Trending in Education. Yeah, it's great. Thanks, Michael, for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, we met a little while back coming out of an EdTech meetup, one of these virtual happy hours uh, that is replacing <laughs> what used to be uh, actual happy hours. Uh, I do find that the, the virtual happy hours are a little bit easier to attend, and you know, it was a great <laughs> way for us to, to meet. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners so that they get a sense of who you are and what got you involved in education? Yeah, w wonderful. Thanks, and I'm I'm just laughing at that uh, at that as well, Michael. I I think those those virtual meetups. Uh, the one advantage is we get to meet people from from all over the globe, which is yes. which is wonderful. And and that was a great um, way to meet you. So so thanks again for having me on. So yes, Warren Kennard, I'm a founder of Connected, and um, also the the managing director of the Cude Academy. And yeah, I've been in, in education for approximately, most specifically higher education for about 20 years, Michael, and covered the gamut of, of higher education activities, mainly from a slant of sales, marketing, business development, and partnerships. Mm -hmm. However, have spent time, you know, also in the weeds, building courses and, and designing curriculum. So I've, and, and lecturing as well. So it's, it's been a, a full spread of activity. And yep. uh, the last 10 years has been principally focused in the last mile learning. So this has been in mainly in workforce development, but also in higher ed and, and professional development and building out small private online courses yes. um, for, for the likes of Get Smarter, which was uh, acquired by 2U a, a few years back and, yep. and yep. working in a couple of OPM providers more recently. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, just to remind people of the acronym in the case of Spock, right? So MOOCs emerged, massive open online courses emerged, and that trend was then soon met with a uh, uh, counter trend or related trend around smaller personalized. What is the what is the actual acronym there? Yeah, I I always navigate towards small private online courses. Yes. But the 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 true definition would be small. Or I, in my opinion, the the true definition should be small personalized online yes. courses. Yes. Because um, that's how I feel about them. But but yes, the initial term was private. Interesting. Got it. Yes, because I, I think I've heard both. Uh, but the idea is, as opposed to the the much bigger, massive courses, yes. uh, you know, massive isn't necessarily, it's something maybe you want in gaming. It's not necessarily <laughs> something that people are seeking out in learning. So yeah. the, the counterpoint being the the Spock, which I thought was, was interesting. I definitely want to get your thoughts on that a little bit more. And then OPM for our listeners. What does OPM stand for? And can you just describe what, what that is a bit? Yeah, so that's online program management. And so these are traditionally the likes of the 2U, the university partners and Wiley and, and others who, and I design and a whole, whole number of them that support universities in helping out in building curriculum mm -hmm. uh, and supporting every need that the university has or college has in, in delivering those programs. So anything yep. from sales marketing through to course creation to facilitation and then post review. So mm -hmm. they're, they're an outsource provider in, in the main. Yeah. And they're a big part of when people think ed tech, educational technology, they, one of the larger areas of focus is the OPMs and the OPMs frequently help the university deliver a MOOC or a Spock, right? Correct. So You've raised a number of things there. So, yes, they're they're an integral part of the higher education um, ecosystem at the moment, mm -hmm. and uh, they they are they are very they're quite polarizing in in many ways. So there's there's a there's a lot of work being done to 
have a lot more transparency about what these providers do. And the, the feeling that I have, the net result is that there's an incredible benefit in what these organizations bring to the table, notwithstanding the importance of the college and, and the higher education provider itself to, to build its own capability and competency. But these providers, the, the good ones, certainly have got a, a wealth of skills and, and talents that that are really helping to advance and, and push the system forward. So, yeah. you know, yeah, look, it, it can be in the form of small private online courses, but in the main, it's what I've seen certainly in the U.S. market is, is very much around post-grad qualifications. And, mm -hmm. and now the likes of 2U and others are, are certainly venturing into the, into the undergraduate experience. Yeah, and... We've made it a few minutes in without talking about, I, I need to start documenting how long it takes my, my conversations to gravitate towards the pandemic, but, but here we go. So <laughs> as, as someone who's been in online education, you know, supporting workforce, but also keeping an eye on what happens uh, around the higher ed space, a lot of that has been moving to online any perspective, because, you know, and also truth be told, and maybe exposing a little bit of your accent here, your, can you tell folks where you're from and where, you know, where your, where your experience is, maybe where you had the most experience? Yeah, no. So the, the accent is um, from Cape Town, South Africa, but I've been muddying that a little bit with the Australian accent over the, the last uh, three or so years. I've been uh -huh. based out of Melbourne. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the, the bulk of my experience has certainly been in South Africa where, and, and if we're speaking more specifically to the latter part of my career, it's been dealing with the US and UK markets through top tier university partners there and with the likes of Get Smarter. So we were building out um, these small person personalized and or private and um, people mediated learning experiences for the likes of Harvard and, and London School of Economics and Oxford and Cambridge and mm -hmm. MIT and, and a raft of others starting locally with the University of Cape Town, um, which is a fantastic institution in, in the heart of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And the uh, speaking to your earlier point, if I may just digress yeah, for a second, please. there's you, you were speaking about the, the emergence of um, these MOOCs, these massive online open courses, and, and kind of this gravitation towards the small private online courses. And mm -hmm. the, what, what I think was the, the catalyst for that was um, we were seeing incredible ideas around democratizing of education through these MOOC providers and, mm -hmm. and accessibility for all and, you know, a, a really wonderful future for, for higher education. But what, what was lacking was the ability to actually facilitate and or embed that learning into somebody's heart and mind and, and being able to equip them with the skills they need for the future. And what we were seeing is that there were there were severe droppages, uh, drops, I, I should say, in in attendance and yep. and then in, in conversion. You know, you were having only a handful of percentage of people actually completing their programs, and so there was all kinds of strife around the commercial model. There was right. all kinds of strife around, you know, how, how do we make this a better experience? And there was a few, the likes of Udacity, the likes of Get Smarter, who who recognized this trend relatively early and and figured out that engagement was key uh, mm -hmm. in order to make a, a student enjoy this experience but also get maximum value out of it so right, right, right. the get smarter model it was really born to pepper individuals with activities to make sure that they were regularly contacted frequently contacted but also very personable approach so yep. we brought the human element into online yep. and that was incredibly important for for us to see massively high completion rates uh, mm -hmm. up, upwards of 90 percent and I think that suddenly got the attention of, of many international providers who recognized that this was a key to success. And so the, the birth of the small private online courses emerged. And it's an area that I now work in with the Kuhut Academy doing very similar things, which, which we can discuss um, as well. Yeah, and I, I really like the turn of phrase "people mediated," where I don't think I heard that until I heard it from, from you. So thank you for that. But uh, can you... Can you expand a little bit on that? I, I think you were touching on it, you know, even talking about the heart or like the emotional uh, component of the program where, uh, you know, yeah. learners can get lost in the, the massive sea that is uh, a depersonalized MOOC. Can you expand a little bit on people mediated? 
Yeah, sure. So I'm not sure actually if the the term is is well understood or well known. I mean, most people would uh, would recognise some kind of facilitation, and and I suppose what we wanted to do there's there's a movement towards re relationship based learning, and if we look at what Whitney Kilgore's been doing at at iDesign by bringing in humanising online learning, these are all um, kind of related in in my opinion anyway. And I, I'm no academic on this, Michael, so please right. forgive me, but the the in essence what we're trying to say is that people themselves co-create with their fellow students mm -hmm. so uh, as part of uh, any learning experience in particular with with the work that i'm doing at, at kahoot now what we recognize is that people bring a wealth of skills experiences and and insights that help co-create the learning for others. Mm -hmm. So part of the journey that, that a student takes is to learn from their, their colleagues and their, their peers. And to do that in a virtual sense is, is, is incredibly difficult and needs a lot of skill. The, the second part of that conversation is around the facilitator, the person who's actually going to be providing tuition and, mm -hmm. and supporting those students and coaching them and the raft of services that exist there. Mm -hmm. So it could be that you have a principal facilitator, like a subject matter expert who's, who's guiding a student on this journey. But there's also a, a series of other people, at least in the case of, of Get Smarter and, and Udacity and, and other providers that do something similar, is that they have, you know, kind of a personable support, be that a, a experienced counselor yep. or a, a academic support or a teaching assistant mm -hmm. so that we can cover the full gamut of, of requirements for these students. So both they get group work and, and facilitated learning experiences with their peers, but they get the support of, of counselors and so on to manage their workload under incredibly pressured environments that we're seeing at the moment. Right. The teaching assistants, academic support, you know, the, the, the technical support, all of these things are absolutely critical if we're going to have a successful learning experience. And this is what we mean by humanizing that experience, people mediated and, and kind of a facilitated online led experience. Yeah. Yeah. I like the phrase too, because it does run counter to the macro trend, which I imagine is pretty uh, relevant here as well. The macro trend towards automation and artificial intelligence still having... Yeah like a human layer at the very end, you know, the actual touch points with the customer, with the learner is more, you know, human and engaged and, mm -hmm. you know, nurturing, you know, a coach like dynamic is something that I think resonates, was resonating prior to COVID. And now in light of COVID, it does seem as though everyone is trying to get to the same place. And what I found interesting about your approach, which, which maybe will help us move a little more into the Kahoot and Connect Ed stuff, is that it seems to get very close to the, the live, what people are thinking about as like Zoom instruction. Mm -hmm. But what you're, at least some of what I've seen of what you're doing is more crowdsourced among experts, but still delivered in yeah. a very sort of informal, human, you know, engaging way. So can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so I'll I'll try not to to conflate these two things, but the one thing that you that you hit on was, was incredibly important. Of course, we we understand this macro trend around uh, automation and and the birth of AI and mm -hmm. and the kind of features and functionalities that it's going to bring to the table and and that dehumanizing component, which. Um, is very relevant, and mm -hmm. and I think the, the we've been speaking about this, especially within higher ed, for for many moons about the fact that we need to start incorporating enterprise or human skills or soft skills, whatever whatever yep. you're wanting to call them. Um, we need to embed these into our courses, and I mm -hmm. I suppose the the extension of what what we're doing that um, now focusing on it wholeheartedly at the Kuhut Academy, we are actually building out a series of of human capability courses in radical empathy and and problem solving and critical thinking and, mm. and, and, you know, leadership and resilience and all of these important skills for, for the workforce, because, you know, everything else is going to be pretty much left to machines and, and automation and algorithms and so on. But right. the people skills and the, the ability to thrive in this environment, in this modern environment is certainly going to come from us to be more able to relate to one another and, and seize this opportunity. Yeah. So, and education, you know, you've, you've hit on another important topic, which, 
which if we look at the the birth of, of online for the vast majority of universities now and colleges globally have needed to to pivot incredibly quickly to yes. to online and and I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not the first and not the last to be banging on about this particular point that we, we've done a rushed experience for students sure. and we are going to see the, the tables uh, or this kind of tables tip in one direction, as it were, whether it be a great online experience into the future or whether students are going to say, you know, this online thing was great, but, you know, I want to go back to my, my face-to-face experience. Right, and, right. and they certainly will vote with their feet. And so... We're seeing this now next trend of, of kind of um, building out or what I'm hoping to see more of is, is building out quality learning experiences for students, which will require the facilitation and or kind of a co-creation with other humans yes. um, is going to. Well, that's certainly my how I preface every conversation is that that's what I believe is going to be the differentiator. And uh, based on anecdotal feedback from from the tens of thousands of students that we've seen come through these small private and personalized um, experiences is that Mm -hmm. they certainly appreciate that and and get a lot of value out of out of those courses Um, yeah yeah we're all suffering in the the isolation and the fragmentation of this day and age and it's it's always interesting and uh, somewhat hopeful when you start to see that technology can enable more intimate connections and more sense of sort of emotional scaffolding that yeah like pretty much all of us need these days you know i think what i find interesting now is that you know as someone who was looking at the future of work i had read about the importance of being resilient and the importance of Mm -hmm. flexibility of thinking and and all these sort of abstract like notional ideas and it's like yeah that does make sense you know it's a vuca world and you know things are very Mm -hmm. Uh, topsy-turvy upside down sure in the abstract i understand that and then 2020 happened and i i think it's much easier to make the case for the 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 central imperative really to develop communication skills emotionally sensitive ways to engage you mentioned radical empathy i do find that 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 turn of phrase also quite interesting you care to Mm. expand a little bit on that yeah, so you're going going straight to answering that point. The the radical empathy course that that we're building is actually with a with a wonderful lady based out of the U.S. Her name is Terry Givens, and she's written a book with the same title. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm I'm in the process of of building out that course with her uh, through the Kahoot Academy. And the the idea here, I mean, I certainly won't take this opportunity to punt the course, but right, what, right. We're trying to, what we're trying to do is, is create a diversity of opinions and, and recognize how we, how we respect and, and treat each other. And empathy is a big part of that, I suppose. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do a punt on the course, but yeah. what, we're, what we're very mindful of doing is, is finding subject matter experts with, with that deep, deep experience in in these particular subject areas and then building curricula around those 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 individuals and together with a very sophisticated learning experience platform we're delivering those courses out to to workforces at scale Mm -hmm. i think the the one point that i wanted to raise which i think is very important michael is that you know there's one thing to have like a people mediated experience as i've coined it and and looking at also this this kind of zoom you where we're looking at kind of this this bringing of the lecturer or facilitator into kind of a zoom environment and and that's not what i'm referring to so Mm -hmm. while there is part of that like live webinars happen during our courses as well and and in many of the instances of those providers that i've spoken about before they they incorporate those tools but what needs to happen is that we need to embed that kind of thinking and the the structure of the course needs to be inherent in its design Mm -hmm. so the fact that we have students coming together in very dynamic ways and in very organic ways. Because if you if you speak to someone about group work in, in any course, you normally get people dropping their jaws and running yeah. out of the, the building as fast as you possibly can. But mm-hmm. when when you look at it in an online mode, there are very, very clever ways of, of being able to do that. And mm-hmm. if your system allows for it, which which having a proprietary system obviously does help, we, we can you know, build those experiences on the fly. We're able to 
in the in the, the teaching and learning design, we're able to embed those those kind of mechanics, which extend well beyond just throwing up somebody on onto the Zoom platform and, yeah. and expecting that to be facilitated. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's very important that that design um, is well thought through and and you know spent a lot of time on on that. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that point, and I think I've made it a few times on the show too. That design thinking is a uh... Uh, a pretty profound development that had its genesis in the 20th century, but it's really coming to fruition, you know, say in the last 10, 15 years. And we're just scratching the surface of good design thinking as it relates to scalable learning experiences. But I am seeing, I'm increasingly hopeful there, uh, even prior to the, the forcing function of the pandemic that new and emerging online learning experiences were getting pretty compelling, in some cases borrowing from the golden age of media and entertainment and gaming and all the other digital innovations that are happening. But I was just beginning to see some really next generation learning experiences beginning to emerge. And now I think everyone has been forced to seek these things out more I would also imagine there'll be increased uh, capital coming in to figure out how do we really, you know, transform and differentiate what a compelling learning experience is. And uh, I also like in that context that I think I share your thinking that making it a very human and um, emotionally resonant experience is really front and center in a lot of the design thinking that goes into to online learning any thoughts on that yeah certainly i mean quite a quite a few in fact i i think it it raises in in my head just one of the things that you you were talking about it, it does raise my deep concern for the university and, and college traditional college environments mm-hmm. and uh, why I say this, and it, it may be a little bit controversial, I suppose I don't think you mind that terribly much, no, Michael, no, no. but the, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the, the bypassing of, of the university and college experience and, and students, you know, just, just seeking alternative paths. And, mm-hmm. and how this ties into what you've been speaking about is that a lot of these technology providers and or kind of corporate companies are doing a better job than, than the university and college provider at the moment in being able to deliver incredible student experiences, you know, mm-hmm. work integrated learning. They've been able to kind of pump a lot of money into it and they've got skills and expertise in, in building up very sophisticated user experience. And, yes. and so what we're finding is that, and, and this is, it shouldn't, so where, where I'm going with it being controversial and, and also sad is the fact that I'm desperately keen to support these universities and colleges and being able to have a better conversation about yeah. what, what needs to happen. And, and I, I see them as having an integral um, uh, part of, of the value chain, of course. Um, sure. And the, the thing that keeps me up at night is this deep vertical experience that that their um, students are when they're bypassing the university the traditional college system and they're going straight into a working environment by studying a a short course that's extremely targeted to a specific discipline yes i worry about what that means longer term and mm-hmm. and how that non-foundational experience that one would traditionally get from a university college experience is going mm-hmm. to dissipate and we're going to have these very very functional highly functional experts Experts, you know, that are employed in the market and very employable skills in the now, but how do we retrain them and do they have the necessary skills commensurate with being retrained? Right. So these are, these are really, I, I mean, it's a bit fragmented and apologies for that, but wow. is like, if you, if you look at what Holland IQ is, is, is a wonderful organization doing mm-hmm. a lot of work in, in aggregating data and, and looking at what's happening on these mega trend levels, and especially in relation to where the money is going and following that money trail. Mm-hmm. And that money trail is very much focused on, on the ed tech environment and those that are um, more uh, aligned to, to bypassing that system because of the this 
the incredibly challenging kind of structures and bureaucracy that's in these organizations yes. to, to not be able to work with them. Mm-hmm. So they needing to find alternative, you know, revenue streams by finding different individuals to work with and or creating their own, you know, talent creation system so that they can bypass the, the college system altogether. Yeah. So, yeah, so it, it's a bit of a waffle. So apologies, uh, apologies for that. Yeah. But I hope that made some sense. Yeah, definitely. I mean, also, I, I think it, it brought me to the, the other side of the employee pipeline in the hiring managers. And as we see this fracturing of educational pathways that we're likely going to see at least for the next two years, you know, I imagine there will be fewer students who will have a traditional on-campus undergraduate experience around the world. And as that happens, how much can you start to piece together best in class educational opportunities from different online providers and then package that in such a way that a hiring manager could say that, okay, Warren did these Coursera courses, this Udacity course and these other, you know, community service or volunteer work or whatever. And I would say in the aggregate that makes him a stronger candidate than Mike, who went to the online program at a particular university. Mm. I think that's, that's going to be the interesting thing to keep an eye on, both in the near term, yes. as people, you know, cobble together their Corona gap year, uh, and then yes. still try to get into that hiring pipeline. How will the hiring managers look at candidates? And then also, how will candidates tell their own story of, you know, really families and individuals, you know, sort of take the reins and say, in this very tumultuous period of the early 2020s, we were intentional and we decided to pursue this educational path. I feel like Mm -hmm. it's a time where you have to be, you can no longer get by with almost like a social promotion approach to, you know, post high school education. You have to be much more thoughtful about it. And then I think it's going to make the job of hiring managers even trickier. Like, how do I, how do I actually evaluate, yeah. you know, the variety that's coming coming across my desk? Yes, yeah, certainly. And and I think you, you've you yeah. I mean, you've opened up an incredibly big can of worms here. The the I mean, there's so much to speak about, Michael. But like in in short, what I think is from a hiring manager point of view, yes, we're going to have to get much more into the into the ability to test and discern whether somebody is able to complete the activity at hand or mm-hmm. the ability for, for people to demonstrate their skills and abilities and, and a portfolio to have some kind of virtual portfolio. And there's a yes. lot of work being done in that space. So mm-hmm. somebody to be able to walk around with this kind of legacy portfolio that they have and, and the ability to, to demonstrate their skills. Yep. And I think the, the kind of peer review element, you know, the, the social media platforms, the like of LinkedIn and others that can do an incredible amount more work with their their peer okay. review systems yeah. so mm-hmm. yeah the ability to to reach out to individuals for endorsement but have that in a much more structured way than than just receiving a random endorsement from somebody you don't know right. um, so these kinds of things are are going to be much more important and in the work that like organizations like Degreed are doing. I'm, I'm an, an incredibly yep. big fan of the mm-hmm. work they, they're doing and the ability to stack both the formal and informal learning and, mm-hmm. and to create a kind of a holistic view of, of what this individual looks like. And, and you raised an even more interesting thing, which I think often gets neglected. And, and this is the, the kind of the, the social and personable part of this, this individual. So mm-hmm. do they, you know, I, I use this example every now and again, but it would be like if you had to happen to witness this person helping an elderly woman across the road with mm-hmm. their, their groceries, right. you know, how does this come into the, the equation and, and how does this make you a more rounded individual that you would most likely want to hire this mm-hmm. kind of individual? So yep, too yep. much of the focus has been on this, you know, three year, four year undergraduate experience and your mm-hmm. formal qualifications, but there's a wealth of stuff that happens outside of that, which we, we need to be able to capture and, and, and make more sense of. And I think, you know, the LinkedIn's, the micro credentials, these kinds of things are making it a lot more um, accessible for students to be able to bolster their profile. And many organizations are leaning into this and saying, you know, we don't need formal qualifications any longer, right. but we're going to do our own assessments and so on. And I think all of those things are, are going to compound and, and, and make it the job for them a lot easier. 
Yeah, I, I, it's, it is interesting as you're talking, made me think about how difficult it is to assess ideas like resilience or adaptability, flexibility of thought, you know, being emotionally present, you know, building trust with your colleagues and teammates, you know, like the, the types of skills that are always part of a hiring decision, at least in my experience. And I think increasingly... Yes as the the more rudimentary skills based work will be automated there is a a new challenge emerging around what the curriculum should look like to develop a uh, a modern workforce i know we're getting close to time but i'd love to get some quick thoughts from you on that cuz it does seem related to some of the course uh, materials that you're putting yeah. together like what sorts of things are you looking for and then i'd love to save a few minutes just to to get your thoughts on any other big trends uh, that are capturing your attention out there. Yeah, no, wonderful. So thanks. So yes, these these workforce development trends, I mean, we're hearing it a, a hell of a lot. The the company I, I work for at the moment, Kahoot, is principally doing bespoke work for large organizations and, and building on incredibly sophisticated learning experiences for them in, in leadership and, and related training. And mm-hmm. it was coming up time and time again for the need for these skills in empathy, as I said, in resilience, and especially mm-hmm. at this time during the COVID experience. But what, what we wanted to do was we wanted to create an on steroided version of a, of a LinkedIn learning suite of courses on, mm-hmm. on something like empathy, where somebody is able to demonstrate their skills, have peer review, be in a position and in a, in a garden world community that they feel trusted and, and empowered to speak from the heart and, and to really bring themselves to, to that learning experience and to, as I said, co-create those experiences and live through the experiences of others. So it's something you need to, to see to really appreciate and for me to articulate well, it needs a, a, a good demo on how yep. these experiences land. But mm-hmm. all I can say is that we are hearing it all the time that these are the skills that are needed and we have a vehicle for for being able to do that now mm-hmm. at scale and and it's a proven model so i just encourage you to to have a look and, and we can certainly um chat again about that in, yeah. in particular for sure yeah and uh related to, there was covid and then the protests in light of the the george floyd murder yep. in uh, yeah. it's similar similar in that they're they're Difficult to anticipate that we would be where we are, although in some ways maybe not surprising depending on who you talk to. But the reality yeah. is that our our social lives are turned upside down in ways we would not have expected. And our lived experiences are different than maybe they had been for the last, say, 20, 30 years. So that yes. we are all confronted with novel and challenging decisions and emotionally charged conversations in ways that I don't think anyone really was expecting it to accelerate this fast into this year, which is why the urgency around developing these new new emotional skills are, is even more profound. So yeah, very interesting yeah. stuff you're working on there. Any thoughts on, on any of this? Or, or also, I'd love to get your yeah. perspective on, there's plenty to talk about these days, so, so no shortage yeah. of, of topics. But, uh, but any <laughs> thoughts uh, on this or what's emerging that, that's capturing your attention? Yeah, so, I mean, two points to close off. And, and thanks, Michael. I really enjoyed the conversation. I think the, the two things that strike me, the two things that, that I'm thinking about is very much about the better online experiences ongoing. So I think that now that we've done this this kind of rushed approach to, to online learning, I'm, I'm very um, keen to help and work with organizations to uh, create much better experiences for their for their students. So So that's the one thing. And then the other thing is that the, the conversation piece. Mm-hmm. So like we're having now, there's my, my concern and what I've seen, you know, just in, in general kind of conversations like this is that we're not, there's not enough people having these conversations and, and thinking deeply about what, what needs to happen and mm-hmm. leveraging the advice of many, many top thought leaders from, from across the globe mm-hmm. about what, what the future could look like. So that just kind of leads me to the the last point which is around the connected experience so the whole idea for connected was 
to or is to build this um, incredible learning experience for for kind of faculty, but it could be administrators and others that have a keen interest in the higher education ecosystem. And we've crowdsourced uh, a whole series of insights from leaders in the field, be they across the ed tech spectrum, but also the OPMs, the, the SPOCs, all, all of those have been included, as well as large technology providers, as well as students themselves. And we've co-created this experience together and have a, a wonderful course that's really a conversation about what that the future of higher education looks like for for your institution and so i'd encourage you to to just you know have a look at that and and your listeners to to have a look at that and and join the conversation it's it's incredibly important that we all come together at this time uh, to have a meaningful impact in in what the sector looks like beyond just going to your your regular conference that you can't attend anymore this right. is a way for for you to enjoy and participate in in that dialogue Absolutely. Maybe go to a meetup where you'll meet someone from another part of the world and uh, get them on your yes. podcast and bada bing, bada boom. There you go. Warren Kennard, thank you very much for appearing on Trending in Education. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Thanks for, so much for your time. I enjoyed that. Awesome. And for our listeners, we'll be back again soon. Thanks again for listening.